Hello, everybody. Welcome to NGO Soul and Strategy. And I am so looking forward to this interview with Lauren Nordgren. Oh, Lauren, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name. Will you, would you mind telling us that first? It was absolutely perfect. Nordgren, you got it exactly right. Is that right? right? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, good. So let me tell you, listeners, about Lauren Nordgren. He is a professor of management and organization at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University in Chicago here in the US. And I invited Lauren to come and talk with us after I attended a really interesting webinar uh, with Lauren and his colleague, uh, David Chantal, Chantal, sorry, I, I'm not really able to pronounce it fully in an in a American way. Um, where they talked about a new book that they are bringing out called The Human Element. Um, and that is about why human beings in, inside organizations or amongst others inside organizations have, are resistant to new ideas and what we can do about that. So before I introduce you further, Lauren, welcome to our show. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. So um, let me tell you a little bit more about Lauren, besides that professorship at Northwestern University, where he is, as he just told me before we started recording, uh, his real identity is that of a behavioral uh, scientist with a strong um, focus on individuals in organizations, uh, the, the psychology and the, the people aspects of organizations. Um, Lauren importantly teaches MBA students, so Masters of Business Administration students and executive education students. What I mean by that is mid to senior level um, executives, uh, practitioners who come back to Northwestern University in Chicago to pursue further uh, training. So he teaches those practitioners. So Lauren does um, know how practitioners think their worldviews and uh, their constraints. As I said, he's the co-author of the book, The Human Element, which we're going to talk about in a moment together with uh, David Chantal. He's also the co-founder of a company called Creative Candor, which sounds interesting. I looked it up, uh, Lauren, and it's about, um, as I understood it, uh, it's about how to have less biased conversations within organizations. I do some work on, on DEI, but I'm afraid that we won't have time to talk about it, but it sounds interesting as well. And importantly, Lauren, you did your PhD in experimental psychology at the University of Amsterdam in my home country. And we had a lovely conversation about that before we started recording. So that's a whole introduction. So let's get into the, the, the meat of things. Um, so if we're going to focus, Lauren, about your book that's coming out in October of this year, called the human element. For the purposes, if we think about the book and the research that you and David uh, encapsulated in the book, tell us a little bit about what that research agenda was that you tried to, to bring together for the book. And tell us a little bit about the kind of cases that you discuss in the book. Yeah, so uh, the, um... The mission of the book, the challenge that we are trying to, to capture and overcome is to understand how do you bring new ideas to life. So um, it, you will hear me use this language of new ideas or, or innovation. Mm. And what is meant by that, what David and I mean by that is something very broad. So it might be uh, how do you bring a new product into the world? Uh, it could be how do you bring a new innovation into the world. And that could be, uh, that could be a, new, a change initiative. It might be something like uh, maybe people in a company aren't following safety protocols and how do, how do we create this change? Uh, it could be new social missions. It's, so it could be something mm -hmm. like um, <clears throat> if you wanted to increase uh, well, there are many things top of mind, things like uh, how do you get people to be vaccinated and wear masks and how do we get yeah. people to come back into the office and how, or, or conversely, uh, how do employees convince upper level management that in fact staying home is in fact a good thing. So mm. the, the way we think about it really is 
it's a it's a very broad challenge, which is how do you bring new ideas into the world, and um, whether that be um, companies, whether it's products, whether it's um, social policy. It, it, for us, it is all the same, mm. and um, I think of this as a uh, as a psychologist who is who thinks a lot about management and, and organizations. Mm -hmm. And David comes to this from the perspective of entrepreneurship, and he's an in influential member of the design firm IDEO. So his yeah. his perspective is, is often a little bit more consumer and product facing. But so from that, but we're all really interested in the same challenge of how do we. Um, bring ideas to life and and again an idea could be r really anything that is a difference from the status quo and um whether that is a tangible element or whether it's yeah. how do we change the way meetings run in our organizations and, and any kind of new idea or innovation is what we are interested in got it and you told me before we start recording that the cases you discuss in the book the human element span actually across the private Nonprofits, kind of social mission and public government uh, uh, sectors. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So it is uh, our interest. Is, so in, in the in the book, we and today in our practitioner work, we're thinking about things like transgender rights. We are thinking about um, cannabis and legalization. We are thinking um, about uh, bringing clean water to groups. So we study a number of cases around um, both companies. Uh, we uh, follow this wonderful uh, uh, organization that is around, um, creates shelters for um, a women who've experienced domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So all of, uh, I would say it's very much a mixture of, um, of context, both private and, and public. Got it. Okay, so clearly a, a book and a body of work that is uh, that you're going to speak more to uh, um, that is totally relevant for our world mm -hmm. in, in, in international civil society. So um, what really interested me about um, what you presented in the webinar that I was able to attend is that you talked about the topic of resistance to new ideas mm -hmm. and that interests me from the point of view of organizational change management and change leadership um, approaches and, and the, the, my own background in that in the international nonprofit sector. So let's first, uh, Laura, maybe hear you a little bit more about the main arguments that you and your colleague David advance in the book around fuel and friction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the basic message is that we need to shift our mindset and understanding about the nature of change. And I think a metaphor can be helpful. So if you think about how, if you're trying to launch a physical object into space, just as at the time of this airing yesterday, we launched Richard Branson mm -hmm. into space. When, when an object, a physical object takes flight, there are two opposing forces that we understand. There is something that propels it forward. So that's mm -hmm. a jet engine. Mm -hmm. uh, often it could be uh, wings, et cetera, for a bird. Uh, but there are also constraining forces. So there yeah. are propelling forces and constraining forces. And these constraining forces are things like uh, gravity and wind resistance. Now, what's interesting is <clears throat> um, the same is true of ideas. So when you launch a new art, an idea, our argument is that there are forces that propel an idea forward. Mm -hmm. And we have a great understanding of what these forces are. Now in the book, we refer to these forces as fuel, that's the label, and fuel takes many forms. So the, if you're adding a benefit to the message, like if, so if you look at, if you are a middle manager and you are trying to, you see a better way to do things, your deep intuition is to add fuel. So you're gonna explain the benefits, yeah. that's fuel. You might use incentives if you have the formal authority to do so, that's fuel. Putting sizzle on the message, anything that 
ignites or incites our desire for change is fuel. Yeah. And however, there are another set of forces just like in the physical world that oppose change. Um, now this brings us to the, the first big picture idea. So these forces that oppose change, we refer to them as friction mm -hmm. and frictions represent drag on innovation. Mm -hmm. the, the central insight of the book is that people tend to think in fuel. Mm -hmm. In other words, in a way, I think a nice way we demonstrate this point is, and I've, this is a question we've now posed to thousands of people. We ask people to explain what enables a bullet to take flight. Physical bullet, why does a bullet fly? And if you ask people that question, the near unanimous universal answer you get is gunpowder. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because gunpowder, so when, when a trigger is pulled on a gun, that gunpowder ignites, it creates tremendous pressure inside the barrel. And the only way for that pressure to be released is to fire the bullet out the end. Mm -hmm. And it is gunpowder that explains why a bullet travels, um, you know, 1300 feet per second, why it travels two miles. That's what gives its, its thrust, that's fuel. Mm -hmm. But the principal reason it's able to fly that distance and with pinpoint accuracy is because a bullet has been optimized to reduce the frictions that operate against it. The principal mm -hmm. friction being drag, because the faster something moves, and this I think is also a, a very important metaphor for organizational change, the faster something moves, the more resistance it encounters. So if you add more gunpowder to a bullet, you're just equally increasing the drag it encounters. And um, much in the same way that people don't think about drag and the reduction of drag as the reason a bullet is able to fly, the same is true with change. So our argument is that people have, so what we call a fuel-based mindset or thinking mm -hmm. in fuel. So the way, how do we create change? Well, we, we add value we heighten the benefits, we add features and benefits, we incentivize, we put our foot on the gas and our deep intuitive mind believes that if people are rejecting our offer, it's because fuel is insufficient. Yeah. Um, so this would in essence be like, imagine building an airplane, only thinking about the engines and not thinking about the aerodynamics. And mm -hmm. our central argument is that this is precisely what people do when they try and bring new ideas and innovations into the world. They think about the fuel, they do not think about the frictions that oppose change. And once you see that, it becomes a little clearer why so few of these ideas and initiatives take off. Yeah, yeah. So if I want to be really simplistic about it, and, and tell me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but for people who've never heard you speak about this, and obviously your book is only coming out in the, in the fall, so, um, so um, none of us has seen that yet, but organizational change managers and change leaders are prone to think more about how can I make my change ID more attractive, right? Rather than and they should be instead, or not instead, but they should balance that with thinking about how can we reduce the resistance to this new idea that is being uh, proposed? Or is it yes, yes. So is, our, is our argument is that the, the human mind naturally wants to focus on the deep intuition is the way I get you to say yes is by elevating appeal, but that is the overexploited resource. It's not mm -hmm. that that is wrong. It's just because we fixate on that so value is a, is a product of benefits and costs and often the thing that really will unlock change often it's the thing that's standing in the way isn't insufficient fuel it's that there is a friction that's preventing people from doing what they want to do yeah and yeah. the human mind thinks oh if they're not buying my product or they're not accepting my message or if if they're if they are not doing what we want them to do it's because they don't believe in the message and our thought is in most cases a lot a lot of great ideas the, the value is self-evident 
the reason they aren't behaving the way we want them to has nothing to do with insufficient fuel. It's because there is some drag, some friction holding them back. Yeah. And that's so we are asking people to shift their mindset to start seeing the full equation, not just the fuel. Exactly, the full equation. And I love what you just said is elevating the appeal is an overexploited resource. Mm -hmm. um, so let's unpack a, this all a little bit more. So in as I listened to you in, in the webinar I attended, you have these four or five dimensions mm -hmm. that can either add to the friction or reduce the friction in terms mm -hmm. of friction about embracing or at least accepting new ideas in organizations by, in this case, change leaders and change managers. So walk me through these, these four or five dimensions. Yeah. So, so we think about four frictions and, and why these four. Uh, so we begin by thinking about, and I, I think this will be interesting to people is to think about the anatomy of an idea. And, and again, when I say any idea, it could be, uh, any kind of initiative or, or innovation. So any new idea, a first dimension of it is, what is the degree of change? Compared to what was? Compared to the status quo, what is today, mm -hmm. what was? Um, does, does the idea that you are proposing, is it a slight tweak? Yeah. Or is it some fundamental radical break from the status quo? Yeah. Every idea can be evaluated on that dimension. And the answer to that question, is it slight or is it radical, uh, determines our, the first friction, which is what we call inertia. Mm. And inertia captures uh, the psychological reality that humans prefer the familiar to the unfamiliar. Mm. Uh, now this is a, an unfortunate reality for the innovator because yeah what what is a new idea a new idea the, the fundamental proposition of a new idea is asking people to embrace the unknown and unfortunately humans often favor what is known what is comfortable what is familiar over the unfamiliar even when even when the benefits of the unfamiliar are indisputable mm. and so the first feature we think about and so what, what i want to offer what we try and offer people in the book is a capacity to diagnose where the frictions reside. So the first friction would be inertia and captures the, 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 the bigger the break in the status quo, the more inertia that should be in, encountered. Now, any idea that you have needs to be implemented. And there's usually a cost to implementation. Now at yeah. times that cost can be slight. It's just a simple step. Mm -hmm. uh, I think more often though, it can be considerable. Yeah. And co the cost of implementation, you could think of in some physical exertion sense, but um, more often, I think particularly within organizations, it's more psychological or cognitive in nature. So if, if your people have been using physical records for 30 years, and this is the system that they know, yeah. um, one, and now you are uh, proposing digital transformation, well, that is one, inertia, it's a radical change. And two, there's cost to implementation. And so the second friction is what we call effort. Effort. And it, the psychology it rests in is that humans are fundamentally uh, sensitive to, like if there's just a few things the human mind is very sensitive to, and one uh -huh. of it, them is energy expenditure. Interesting. It's why your listeners right now at this point are wondering how much longer is this podcast? <laughs> we are very sensitive to, to effort and exertion. And that is the second dimension. Um, and then the, the third being we think about, well, what emotions, a, any new idea is going to create some emotional reactions. Now, what we want is for our ideas to inspire confidence and hope and excitement some positive feeling and that's we're trying to use often our messaging to create that fuel um, but as we explore often our ideas produce the very opposite effect and um, and we call that emotional friction when our ideas uh, create negative emotions and so 
Can I just follow up on that a little bit yeah. more? So to make it concrete for our audience, are we talking about emotions, negative emotions, such as either a sense of threat or a sense of loss, whether there is loss of identity, um, prestige, access to budgets, yeah. um, jobs, you name it? Yeah, it, uh, so maybe a quick, quick example. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the organizations uh, I've worked with is the, the US Army Recruiting Office. And what is the change they're trying to bring into the world? They want more recruiting. And I suspect that's a, a similar, similar mission for most NGOs. It's they, they want to, they want growth or they want more candidates. They want better candidates. More so, supporters. So, so what, so what the US Army wants is to increase enrollment and the quality of enrollment. And you can, so in the US, in the, in the United States, although you could apply this anywhere, uh, in the United States, they principally um, go after 17, 18 year olds, often people who are about to graduate high school. That's their target audience, their target market. And, you know, there's some, there are some that they're never gonna reach because it's just not for them. Uh, but then there is a group that seems very excited, but what the US Army, they had this puzzle, these, these students, they would often initiate, they would have two, three, four interactions with the Army recruiter. They were, you could see their excitement. They were clearly engaged. Um, but then there's a high rate of those people that just disappear. Mm. They just, they never sign the contract. After all that excitement, they just disappear. Mm -hmm. And what does the US Army think? They're, they, this is just a feature of, they think they have a fuel problem. Right. So they think, oh, we need to do a better job explaining the value, the value proposition of being in the Army. And it's not right for everyone, but for the right people, there's a ton of fuel, patriotism or meaning. Many of the same things you would get from work in, in NGOs. Yeah. Patriotism and meaning. Um, see the world. Make a difference. Camaraderie. Also, there's often financial element. Mm -hmm. A chance to get into a different sort of professional track later in life. So what the U.S. Army thinks, we need to do a campaign that will demonstrate the fuel more vividly and so they launched this huge multi-million dollar ad campaign and it does nothing it does next to nothing and the reason for that is they don't have a fuel problem they have a friction problem the reason all these students as uh this was not as in this particular case this was not a systematic exploration but he's talking to some of some of the people who are disappearing uh there is an emotional friction that is holding these people back from signing up, from enlisting, which is what they want to do. And uh, it was, they were scared to tell mom. Mm, so interesting. Parents, you're 17, 18 years old. You have never once initiated a serious conversation. Like what is required of you? What is required of you is to walk into the living room and say, mom and dad, I, I need to tell you guys something. Family meeting. Uh, and many, they would put it off and they'd think about doing it another day. And before you know it, that dream of joining the army, they can just never overcome that, that hurdle. And the thing you, you might consider is, notice is that all those ads, the, the plan in no way helps them with the problem that they have. Yeah. And once the US Army Recruitment Office had that insight, mm -hmm. they've, um, you can imagine how they would pivot. And the pivot is now, now they, and, and this can take many forms. And this is one of the, the, the nice features is once you understand a friction, you can solve for it. But basically the way they've solved this problem is now they help the students have those conversations. I see. So they provide them scripts or talking points or something like that. Yeah, or okay. even have the conversation on their behalf. Oh, right. Interesting. I thought there was a, a fourth dimension or, and that is autonomy, yep. and, right? And, no, so the fourth dimension is what we call reactance. 
yeah. and is simply is the new idea being imposed upon people or not and it's so it's 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 rooted in autonomy and and it's the 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 psychology of this is humans have a fundamental need to exert control uh and the act of change and influence at some level operates against this fundamental need because we are putting people down a path and the more people feel as if they are pushed on that path unlike physical objects uh the human response is to push back because they're trying to maintain the this fundamental need yeah. and the stronger the push the more of this resistance and the label we give to that is reactance reactance which is a nice term i had heard it before but only in in um more academic uh circles so mm -hmm. very valuable and of course in our daily life we can imagine this in our relationships with our partners or spouses with our children and so on it's yeah indeed principle right yeah, yeah. So super interesting. I really encourage our, um, our, our audience to have a look at your book when it comes out. Now, there was one term, uh, David, that I wanted to ask you about um, that you used in, in the Kellogg webinar, and that was neophobia. Mm. So the f familiarity effect, uh, the preference for status quo, etc. that you say, I, I, my notes tell me you said, that this does not just pertain to humans, but also to animals, and that there is some, or maybe a lot of research that 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 is also true across cultures, national cultures. Yeah. Yes. So, so neophobia is a, a term for um, a, a characteristic of humans, of primates, of not not all animals, but uh, but it goes beyond primates. But if we just want to look at humans and primates. It was first studied with primates, um, as I understand it. And th the idea is that when you put a new, so if you were to take chimps at a zoo and mm -hmm. you put a new object into their enclosure, the first response is anxiety. The first mm -hmm. res response is skepticism, um, fear, anxiety. And but after a period of a couple of days they acclimate and now this once once threatening object is now their favorite distraction and the term for that is neophobia and uh from an evolutionary perspective the idea it, so this speaks to the the foundation of inertia this idea that mm familiarity so think of it this way imagine you're on a deserted island and there's two fruit trees, one you recognize, and you it's a banana tree, and it's something else you've never seen before. And it's highly, it's it's green and spikes and, and orange fruit, flesh. Like which one are you gonna eat? You're gonna eat the thing that you know because okay. familiarity signals that you have survived encounters with this thing in the past and <laughs> and that preference drives us towards familiar options mm, interesting and and um uh you know this this research so neophobia shows up consistently across most cultures national cultures that have been studied or is it more prevalent in some than others i'm yeah. just curious no these are whether it's so if you look at the the various the, the the four frictions these are all rooted in in deep universal behaviors um now it's certainly true that there are cultural elements to to these things and that could be organizational culture um mm -hmm. but the, the autonomy this the fear of the the preference for the familiar mm -hmm. that these are all deeply universal responses interesting yeah so my last question before we go to a quick round of kind of random questions is mm -hmm. um and and um there may not be much to the question so feel okay. free to say that but um as you know uh, my work is primarily focused on international nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. um could I get you to speculate a little bit, or maybe to speak from, from direct observation or from, from research, is does the resistance to new ideas and this issue of friction needing to be um, um, grasping and, and addressing friction as much as fuel, um, does that 
play out at all differently in a nonprofit sector as uh, compared mm. to that in the private mm. sector, you think? Uh, I don't think so. So my, my response would be the way I would answer a question like this is to say, well, let's diagnose the frictions. And I will um, offer up if I'll, we can say this at the end, but they can, uh, listeners can reach out to me and I'll share the, some tools, some tools that aren't, won't appear in the book. But if you analyze the frictions, uh, if I don't, this human behavior uh, exists in any context. Mm. So if I were working with a NGO, if I were working with a nonprofit, I don't, wouldn't apply a different lens than if I were coming in and working in finance or coming in and working with a, with the startup. Okay. That's, that's what I was, was wondering. If, yeah. If it's maybe. a radical idea, inertia exists there, whether it is a, um, a mission-driven or profit-driven enterprise. Got it. Yeah, makes total sense. All right, we are nearing the end of our interview. So, Lauren, I have three random questions for you, and there mm -hmm. are three statements or beginning of sentences, and I'll say dot, 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 and I'd love you to, and to finish, complete the sentence. Oh, great. Uh, uh, but they're not totally random in sense. This time I've chosen them. Um, to still align with our topic today. So okay. here we go. Question one. Um, and, and you can take them in, in turn. So I'll stop in between all three. Before NGO change managers make their next move, they cannot neglect to dot, dot, dot. Uh, think about the frictions that hold people back. Okay. Second one, something that NGO change managers should stop doing is dot, dot, dot. They should stop treating their new ideas and innovations as their own. Mm -hmm. And they should think about how they can invite people into the process as early as possible. Okay. The inviting into the process is, I, in my observation, is a uh somewhat ingrained in our sector meaning our 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 organizations uh tend to be relatively participatory and consultative mm -hmm. sometimes one could argue excessively so um but um stop treating something as a new as their own is i think is was really for me mm. a very interesting phrasing that uh, that piqued my interest okay the last question uh, a new question that is coming up for me, that is for you, Lauren, in uh, my research on resistance to new ideas is dot, dot, dot. Uh, a new question is, um, how do these apply in this, a fully virtual world? Ah, interesting. I don't know that I have a great response to that, but that is a question a lot of people are asking. Okay. If you had a two sentence response, like an inkling that you wanted to speculate about, I'd be uh, very curious to hear it. But if not, um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, it is, um, uh, the, I th so as I see it, one of the fundamental so at this stage, I think the initial resistance to much of the virtual interaction was one of around inertia. It was so radically different, but because we were forced into this change, it was a unique moment where a lot of this innovation, social uh, uh, collaborative innovation was allowed to overcome that resistance out of necessity. Yeah. Um, but now I think one of the big challenges is to think about the dimension of effort and the fatigue that surrounds this kind of interaction style. In fact, I think many of the many of the practices people think is fuel is actually represents friction because this kind of interaction style is is more taxing. More taxing. Okay. Uh, something tells me that I'll come back to you in mm. 
X months or so when you've developed that further, because as yeah. I'll say in a moment, uh, I do a little bit of work on virtual team leadership and, yeah. and that sounds uh, super interesting what you just said. So we need to talk about that. So Lauren, at the end now, where should people go if they want to find out more about you, about the book and about the ideas? Yes, so um, uh, for the book, uh, the book comes out on October 5th, but uh, you can purchase the book through pre-order on Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look up the human element on Amazon, you will, you will find it there. Um, and the Kindle, the audio v version is, is coming online shortly. So Amazon is where you can find the book. If uh, listeners would like uh, additional tools, please email me directly. Um, okay. And I can also share the first chapter with them if you don't care to wait until October 5th. Mm -hmm. um, so for additional tools, and if we can put my email, yeah. my, it's a long one in, in the, um, on the if website. Okay with that? Yeah, so um, please do that. Um, and then for uh, any other information, you can go to um, my website, laurennordgren.com. So we can share that there. Okay, good. Awesome. I will put that in there, all of that in the in the show notes. But reaching out to me directly is best. Okay, that's lovely that you're open to that. Well, thank you, Lauren, very much for your insights. I um, I found uh, your webinar uh, uh, of um, Kellogg really fascinating, and I I was eager to share uh, some of your thinking with uh, with my audience. So um, thank you, listeners. If you found this uh, podcast episode stimulating, then please check out the other uh, episodes of my podcasts. You can find many of those, not just on my website, but also uh, on my new YouTube channel. Subscribe and you'll always be the first to know. If you found the podcast valuable, then please uh, write a review so that other leaders like yourself can find it more easily. Um, on my website, you'll also find more information about our co-authored book, Between Power and Irrelevance, The Future of Transnational NGOs. Uh, and finally, I'm excited to say that today, yes, today, um, our Five Oaks consulting team uh, launched the announcement of a new online course called Post-Pandemic Virtual Team Leadership Essentials. And I'm very excited to... Um, to um, have you have a look at that both at my website, but also at the, um, the course um, um, website, which is fiveoaks.teachable.com. So with that, thank you very much. I look forward to um, spending time with you, uh, listeners, on NGO Soul and Strategy next time. Thank you.